And with that, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Rachel Locke to present the C major team. Thanks, Josh. So next up, we have our final talk of the evening. We're honored to have Julian Stora and Cesare Ferrari here from C major. And tonight they're gonna to be talking to us about the process of resurrecting the long discontinued native instruments emulation of the sequential circuits Profit 5 called the Pro 53. And they're going to be talking to us about porting from the legacy C++ code base to C major for their aptly named Pro 54. Um, if you'd like to join me in welcoming Julian Stowe and Cesare Ferrari. Hello, hello. Hello, thank you. It's going to be a lot less mathematical than the last two talks. Is, um, yeah. Definitely, we're, the, we're the, the fun bit at the end, and we know you, everyone wants to get to the pub, so we're going to make this as easy as possible. We'll, yeah, we'll definitely... Um, well, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so who knows what C major is? Okay. Well, lots of hands. Yeah, there's some down. Half, right. Okay, there's enough, there was enough down that we should still keep this, this okay. slide. So just a quick sort of overview of who, what, what we do and who we are. Um, C major is... Um, uh, it, it's, we're, we're pitching it as a language for writing DSP code, but it's a language and a runtime and a kind of JIT compiler and um, a platform, essentially, for running your code. Um, it's... Uh, a sort of C family language, so it's, we try to be um, familiar to people like ourselves who've grown up on C++ and C and C bracy kind of languages. Um, it's aimed at going, uh, producing code that we can run very, very fast and efficiently in our JIT engine, but also being portable to things like WebAssembly to run in browsers and um, exporting it as a C++ juice project and being able to build plugins and Lots of different targets from like one simple code base um, and being very portable. Um, I think that's probably enough of an overview. You'll get the gist as we go on. We're yeah, gonna... I mean, I, th I think the, the, the sort of one-liner is it's, it's basically shader language for DSP. Yeah. I think that's the, probably the easiest way the to describe it. The elevator pitch. Um, and um, yeah, the other, the other bit is that we do have... Um, UI support, and we use JavaScript. So basically, the expectation here is that a plugin would have C major source code for the DSP and JavaScript for the UI, and it would all work together beautifully, and people can run stuff and not know or care what the technology is behind it. Um, next thing on our talk is, um, is this, this idea that um, we're going to kind of resurrect an old synth that's no longer around. So then the question is, why, why bother? I mean, who cares about old instruments? I mean, mini Moogs and um, 303s, I mean, they're, they're cheap on the second hand market, right? Because nobody wants them anymore, right? <laughs> ah. And then, of course, that brings us on to the question, is there going to be the same for software, or is there already the same for software? Are there going to be musicians growing up with particular instruments, software instruments that they, they love, that for various reasons have become kind of end of life for the manufacturer, or the manufacturer's gone out of business, and then there's somebody going to be somebody, some poor sod with a Windows 95 box, still running some ancient version of Cubase so that they can run one particular plugin. Or is that what the world's going to look like? And I, I hope it isn't. So. Um, in an ideal world, we'd be in a, in, a, in a situation where people are producing plugins in such a way that they have got a much longer life than, than just that one manufacturer that, you know, maybe the source code opens, becomes open source, and then people are going to be able to run it forever, sort of build it for their current targets rather than these ancient crusty ones. So then, people that have been involved in... in, in um, software development will have a pretty good idea about the, the challenges of keeping old code running. It's, it's not zero cost. There's all sorts of reasons why it can, be, it can be grim trying to resurrect an old project, or just the ongoing cost of trying to keep one of these things building and, and deployable on, on modern operating systems. So just as a starting point, even finding the source code, um, getting it onto your machine, um, as I said, um, Visual Source Safe, um, 
people remember mm -hmm. this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all, it's, you know, there's astonishing repositories of source code that even getting it extracted into a directory in your computer could be a pain. Um, and then, obviously, you then have dependent libraries and build systems and dependencies there, whatever it is, it's, it's all grim. Um, and even if you can get hold of those, the source, and you can get hold of the dependent libraries, and then you try and build it on a modern compiler, you'll discover that C++ has changed. Um, the, all the assumptions that, oh, you're on a Mac, it must be a PowerPC. Um, and I <laughs> mention that specifically because, obviously, this project is from an era when the expectations of the architectures and the operating systems are quite different from, them, from today. So it's, it's grim, it's difficult, um, it's easy to overlook and just think, oh, well, I can just pull that project up from 10 years ago and I'll just rebuild it, it'll be easy, right? No. So if we're going to go through the effort of resurrecting an old project, so, so they, there you are, you've got this C++ project and you've, you've not been building it for years and you think to yourself, um, I'd love to get that running again. Um, if you're going to go through all that pain and effort, modernizing it so that it will be compiled with the modern C++ compiler. Um, if you're putting that much effort in, why not go slightly further or a different route and say, should I be even modernizing this? Because once I've got it into that modern C++, in 10 years' time, I'll have the same pain. Maybe I could port it to a different language. So in our pitch here is what would happen if you were to instead um, port it to C major? What's going for it for C major as a target rather than, say, Faust or some one of the other possible DSP-specific languages? Well, we're basically a C, C++ type language. So you can take C++ and re-implement it in C major, and it kind of looks the same shape. It's procedural. It's got the same basic structures. Variables work the same way. There's an awful lot of similarities, which means that there's reduced effort there. Um, having done this, so say you succeed in moving it across, you've then got yourself in a situation where you, you by default get support for all of the platforms that C major can target. So you can do a WebAssembly build for the web. You can do a, a build for a particular modern architecture that maybe the original, um, the, the original plugin was not ever targeting. We have potentially got future proof. Now, what that relies on is if C major is match built with C major, will automatically get that target. So you don't have to revisit your project and say, um, you know, like um, add in something to the make file to target a new type of architecture and or, or plug-in format and then do the various, jump through the various hoops to make that work. The other thing is, even if you decide that you don't want to target it as a C major patch, you can still export for C++. So you can actually take the C major code that, that's running and then say, actually, just dump it out of C++. I want to do something else with it. And it's very self-contained C++. It doesn't have um, include any other libraries or any other dependencies. So it's kind of vanilla, which means it's basically probably going to work in the future as well. Or at least we'll update it to work with. Well, yeah, future that C++. becomes our, our problem yeah. rather or, than Or yours. when everyone's using Rust and C++ is gone, yeah. we'll, we'll make it do Rust. But not until then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, coming at it from the other direction, it's like, well, oh, this is going to be hard, isn't it? I've got to learn this strange language. Um, what am I going to do with my GUI? There's all sorts of other bits and bobs, you know, all this other um, dependencies. You know, I've got this library of presets I need to load or re respond to particular message of MIDI events or whatever it is. So, so there's, a, there's a sort of, oh, it, it can't be as easy as that. There's got to be other, other things. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a concern. So um, mm. if we come back to this, yeah, this, this discussion about you know, why is it roughly the same shape and why is it easy? Oh, yeah, I mean, I did this slide last night and blur your eyes, don't read it. It's just um, so thinking about like the process of porting from something that's C++, maybe a juice plugin or, I mean, all, all C++ plugins are kind of the same shape, a bit juice plugin shaped to C major. It's, it's not a million miles away. If you kind of replace the word class with the word processor and, um, I mean, they're doing very different things, but essentially, you know, you're, you're writing a, 
a thing in braces, and inside there you're, you've got something that declares your inputs and your parameters, and you've got something that you know um, uh, has um, some state variables that are kind of going to live in there, and then you've got um, either a process block or a main loop that is doing the actual sample rendering. And it's the braces are similar, the parentheses mm. are similar, and it, are the, are the sort of the, so you know as we show you like an example of how this works. It, 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 you're not you're not porting from you know you don't have to just go back to the drawing board and reimagine the whole thing in functional terms or something. It's kind of it, it, it's similar similar paradigms. And um, in the syntax, we, you know, this is kind of why we did it this way. We wanted to be C family. Um, you know, we, we want people to be able to look at some C major code and go, oh, I get it. You know, especially if there's an expression there with some floats and ints and um, and if and while and for loops, we want them all to look kind of like you, we don't want to have to explain that stuff. Um, but we have modernized the syntax a bit, so you know there are things like you know we've had we've got like a let um, a, a let um, keyword and things like that. We've got a simpler generic system than C++ templating. Uh, we've got no pointers to worry about. We've got we've cut a lot of things out of the language. It's not you can't do all the horrible, messy stuff you can do in C. It's very safe and very contained, but it's familiar. So the general kind of approach we've taken, we ported we ported Pro 54 and we ported a few other little bits and pieces from C++. And essentially, it's like yeah, this is the steps you you, you do boilerplate C major. You get your C++. You stuff it in there. It doesn't work. You hit compile. You look at the first error, and it'll be like, you might actually get a few lines in before you get an error, but then you hit an error, and you go, OK, I'll rewrite that line, and just keep going. And it works out pretty well. We'll, we'll go through some actual examples. So yeah, the Pro 53, um, Pro 50, you know, I, I can always get the numbers mixed up. I can <laughs> describe ours as the Pro 53. I think it was the Pro 52 first, wasn't it? Well, it's the Pro 5. Pro 5. And the, yeah, so and the 52 and the 53. The 53. So so we have this code base which um, goes back, um, I suppose, 25 years. Um, this is kind of a dog fooding exercise. So we were we were we were um, part of the NI group at the time, and we had our language, and we're trying to convince engineers that you can do quite a lot with C major. Mm -hmm. We and said, like, have you got anything knocking around that yeah. we could <laughs> have a go at? And um, through only months of um, legal arguments, we managed <laughs> to get, actually, permission to, to take this, because they, they finally realized that they hadn't done anything with this for 10 years, and were never going to do it. But, um, and they let us actually have the code and go off and run with it. Yeah, so, so this is the, the, the state of the Pro 53 project when we got hold of it. This is, this is a slight lie, because there was an effort to make a juice version of it, which is the, co the source code that we actually moved across. But this is talking about the, the Pro 53 project as was released as a plugin that was out there. Um, so 11,000 lines of code, um, and it had all of the stuff that you would expect. So you know, back then in the, in the late 90s, um, fixed versus floating point maths is a kind of a classic thing, like which is the right way to go. Um, there's a, there's a lot of um, basically optimization, or we would say premature optimization these days, because obviously it isn't it isn't applicable. It was applicable at the time, but then code bases end up with all of this cruft in there that you then think I don't need all of this stuff. Um, yes, and um, 3D now um, mm -hmm. again that hugely useful code path. Um, Sounded so good though, 3D now with the exclamation mark. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so this, is, this is what we, we took on. Um, so what was, the, what was the approach? Well, divide and conquer, basically. So if you, if you looked at the project, and a uh, plugin basically looks like this, three, there are three components. There's the DSP, there's the user interface, and there is all of this support stuff, the stuff that isn't quite obviously in either of those two buckets, um, loading presets, um, stuff like that. So the aim here is to port the DSP to C major. Um, and as we described, described, there's a very iterative approach, which is just about to look at it and go, stuff it into a file, dot C major, and hit compile and see what happens. Um, and um, the GUI, well, obviously, we're going to be in JavaScript rather than C++. Rather than trying to um, 
do an equivalent process, it's actually easier just to look at it and think, well, it's a pretty noddy UI. It's got some knobs and there's some, some pretty pictures and stuff, and that's it. Well, pretty pictures from 1999. Um, and then there's the control logic, and again, just re-implement re it. So we went re-implementing JavaScript for those two, but the DSP was, the C++ was ported. So when we started looking at the DSP code, um, there was basically a fairly obvious shape. So the processor, as Jules mentioned earlier, you end up with a, with a processor. It's got inputs and outputs, a load of parameters. They're obvious what they are, this big file with all of these defined um, named parameters. Just plug them all in. So create a processor in, in C major and then just say, there's this input, there's this input, there's this input. Um, because the um, original C++ maps parameters to controls internally, the easiest thing was to add them as events, and then there's an event handler in, in C major where you say, when you receive one of these parameters, apply this bit of logic. And here's an example of it on screen. So this is a, a, um, um, the envelope amount. Um, obviously, filter env means envelope amount, which obviously you can tell. Um, and the p5 underscore m underscore filled m final is obviously the envelope amount scaled by multiplied by 192. Um, yeah, there we are, <laughs> clear. Um, so yes, the equivalent code on the right hand side was what we turned this into in, in C major, which is taking a value and scaling it and applying it. And then this smoothing function was ported across. So obviously we've changed capitalization um, because obviously some maniac um, wrote set knob smoother with a capital S at the beginning. Ah. I mean, I think originally we didn't. We just we left all the symbols the same. Yeah. And yeah. then and then I couldn't help myself afterwards going through and <laughs> and tidying it um, up a bit. And and sort of um, I can't remember what we do the yeah um, so yeah so we basically wrote the main function shoved the original code in. Now, fortunately, I mean, in the sense of to the ease of porting, the original was written, written as one basically big process function. And it's funny, I spend so many, like, you know, it's done so many talks telling people, don't do that. But actually, it's really useful. It made it, made it very easy <laughs> for us, yeah. Um, and I think if you go back then, it was probably considered to be um, that the inlining of um, function calls probably wasn't very good in all of the compilers. So it was probably done for performance reasons. Whether it was right or not, don't know, but we were in the fortunate position. That's, that's what we had. Um, there was voices. Obviously, it's a synth. There's voices and voice structures and things. Um, and again, um, the resulting um, Pro 54 code has a, a structure representing a voice and all of the same parameters mapped into there. So the, the processor actually has an array of voices rather than a separate voice processor, if that makes sense. It's not, it's not pulled out into, there is no um, graph in, in C major with a voice being separated from the entire synth. It's all kind of bodged in one big thing. That's what the original code looked like, so I've done the same. Um, and yes, when you're compiling it, what you end up doing is that you find a symbol that it can't find. Um, <clears throat> and so what you do is that you work out what the equivalent in, <clears throat> in C major is, and then just do a copy and replace. So basically, um, you know, replace every instance of this incorrect thing, and, and you would find that there's the same error or the same change to be made lots, lots of times, and invariably that was the right thing to do. So it ran, ran through those sorts of um, big capitalized P5 names once, and got them all moved across. Um, there are language differences which we have to change. So um, you'll see this all the time. You know, an if variable name type 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 function that just sort of says compares it with zero basically. Um, and um, we don't have that in C major. We have to explicitly do the comparison because it's error prone. Um, we're trying to make things easier for people. No, we're trying to make them less error prone. Make it less error prone, yeah. Um, Easier in the long run. Yeah. Um, and again, we don't, if you index into an array, we have um, bounded types that are guaranteed to be in a particular array, array range. And again, moving those what were integer data types in Pro 53 into wrap types in 
um, our implementation <coughs> um, was, a, was an obvious thing to do. It's, it's good for performance, and it makes the code clearer and easier to read. But none of this is very hard. It was, it was, no. These are all small, straightforward things, and you see that you see the error, and you go, "Oh, I see, I see what clearly why I need to do that." So, because uh, cause once it compiles, it'll obviously work. It did, though. That's the stupid I know, thing. I know it did. That it? was weird. But <laughs> <laughs> never happens, but it does. So there we are. So um, this is what happened when we got rid of all of the, the errors. Um, it ran, um, and there's all the parameters um, with a random value. I think I initialized them with the first patch in the, in the first bank, just so that basically um, Pro 54, if you just played on the keyboard, would make the same sound as the, the, the sort of the initial patch in Pro 53. And it sounded pretty bloody good. I mean, it, I, I didn't know for certain it was identical, but it seemed to work in the, in the right way. So I went, that's the result, move on. So what do you do with the GUI? Um, the original was not a Juice project. It was um, an NI framework, but basically it worked in a fairly obvious way. It was some control, defined controls in, uh, in um, C, as C++ classes with um, image strips to represent the different shapes for each of the parameters, uh, of each of the controls. So it was very easy to write JavaScript equivalent for those, so we created classes representing each of the control types, so a knob, a button, um, I think there was some sliders. Mm -hmm. um, LEDs. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and then just basically took the graphic assets across um, and put the background on, and then it's a case of writing some CSS and laying out the controls in the appropriate places on the, on the GUI. Um, this was a case of guessing where its location was, the knob's in the wrong place, zooming in, moving it a few pixels here and there. Um, yeah. was not hard. Boring. It was just a bit boring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it didn't take that long, really. Yeah, it didn't take long. And that gave us that. Now, notice the, um, the back, the um, image has got C major and Pro 54 superimposed, and Harriet's just mentioned she did actually have a hack around with this, and <laughs> uh, we... Um, we didn't use that version. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and so at this point, we've got a fully functioning synth, the knobs work, um, the keyboard, the sound plays, but there are no presets. So we, we were talking before, there's this third aspect to, to this synth, which is um, something that needs to know a bank of presets, um, uh, allow the buttons that you say, selecting different parameter, uh, different pro saved programs, saving, um, editing parameters so that they get saved in the bank, all that kind of other bits and bobs. Um, and we have this in C major, a patch worker. So this is, you could think of it as um, a, a UI that doesn't have a, a panel. Uh, yeah, it's essentially, so is it, it's a, it, it treats itself like a UI, but it's just off screen. So yeah. it's there all the time. So. Um, all the kind of bits and bobs you need to do, the, the, the kind of housekeeping work that a plugin needs to do. It's very easy in JavaScript while you've got the UI on the screen, but you might need something that's running longer term, like loading, like when it, when it gets um, a, a patch change message coming in, without a UI, you need something that can figure out which parameters to twiddle and do that all as we're running, mm -hmm. and do loading and saving and boring stuff. And yeah, and we, we put this on a thing called the patch worker, which it's a kind of a thread. It's actually not a thread. It's just running on the, on the um, main thread with events. Um, very easy, very straightforward uh, to use. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for this, this, that's where we put the, all of the preset handling. I don't think it does much else. Does it do anything else? So, it, 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 it's, so there's, there's two tasks that I'm aware of. It's probably a little bit of other subtlety around loading and saving. But basically, um, it makes sure that the preset bank is, is loaded. Um, and it listens, it hooks into MIDI events. Yeah. So it oh, sees program changes yeah. and makes sure that they are fired across. If you think about it, because um, if, we did the, if we did that stuff in the UI, if you closed the window and said a program change, there'd be nothing there to respond to it. 
Mm -hmm. And doing it in the DSP doesn't really make sense either because yeah. it's not it doesn't have to be real time it doesn't have to be sample accurate um, behavior. Yeah. So yeah this is sort of this got kind of boring background task category of, of things you might need to do when we put these on a, on a patchwork and write them in JavaScript. And um, yeah. Um, and then we have the complete synth. Um, I can show you it. We should fire it up. I was just thinking did we ever did we ever profile it for performance compared to, to the original? Oh, did, loads, did you ever do loads that? Faster. No, I didn't. Because right. um, I, I was just. I, I didn't have. I, great I to didn't say have faster, the original running on, on this know. machine. So no, that's true. Yeah. Um, that would have been a good ending. But no, but, um, um, I've gone the wrong way. It's probably over here somewhere. Oh, here we go. So the code's all open, by the way. I mean, you can go and look at the whole thing. Um, <coughs> Um, I, don't know, I don't know how long our main function is in this. It, it, it's ter very, very long, but I don't, I don't know how um, sinfully long it is. It's three and a half thousand lines in total, and we're... Well, very written worse, Ben. Not one sober. There's all, these, all the event handlers um, triggering stuff. Um, triggering stuff down here somewhere, so probably halfway down. So it's 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 probably fifteen hundred lines for main. Yeah. Anyway, um, if I it's fine try running it, um, I don't know what I've done with window uh, panel sizes and things. Can you just close that for the minute? Oh, I can't see the close button. All right. Ooh, oh, he's got excited. Wow, oh, we've gone into hysteresis mode. Wow. Yeah, good. Nice. Right. Okay, there it is. It's a little bit less blurry. Um, um, there may be sound coming out, but I can't hear it. There is sound coming out somewhere. Oh, there it is. It's actually a really good sounding synth. Um, so, yeah, so there's, there's all of the. All of the presets are in here um, from the original instrument. I mean, I'm just just using ones at random. Um, so yeah, there it is. It's it's there. It runs. Um, the knobs work. <laughs> <laughs> I I mentioned um, that. Um, uh, oh, that's got to open the completely wrong window. I'm now going to struggle to do this. Go and see. Um, this is the the the, the GUI. Um, if I were to um, try and choose something that's going to be visible, um, um, uh, what would be an easy thing to up. change? Oh, um, something to to see to, to changing. Just, just, oh yeah, gosh. Um, um, oh, I'll go to the first one. First one's good. Okay. Um, the filter envelope. This is is um, this knob at the top corner here. Um, let's move it, let's put it in the wrong place. Oh, the window's moved, oh, there we go. So, so now, now you can kind of see it in the wrong place. The, the background actually has the, the, the control baked into it, like the, the default position, so you can kind of see. So, so the, the effort to put things in the right place was really a case of going, oh, that needs to be across a bit, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you kind of like, it's like, oh, it moves across a bit, and then you put it in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there it is in the right place. But that's the, that's the sort of um, because because it's a JIT system and because um, you know, well it's a small project, um, the iterative move things around is very very easy in, in C major. You you get the same with the DSP. So um, introducing um, you know, as I said, like you know, put a typo in. Um, there's a problem. It's underlined the right line. This will take you to the to the error, um, fix the error, save it, and it's back up and running. So, so working through the, in, incrementally working through the compile errors to sort of fix it is actually very quick with uh, with a language and a runtime like this. Um, so, I just thought we'd mention where we've ended up compared to where we started. So the original 53 was 11,500 lines of C++. Um, 
run on a power PC. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, was, I said x86, I don't know if it was 64, don't know. Um, and there was a VST2 and a standalone build for the, for the two. So when we've moved that to C major, we've ended up with just over two and a half thousand lines of code and a thousand lines of JavaScript. So we're about a third of the size. Um, now, if you think about it, all of the other code that was in the original is still somewhere, but it's in our runtime. It's not something that is project specific. So you know, we've still got all of the logic to connect to audio interfaces and host stuff and all the rest of it. But you just, as a as a as a patch, as a as a plugin, you don't have to include that. Whereas obviously, every time you write a um, a plugin, you end up having to put all sorts of boiler boilerplate stuff in it. And of course, this is the project itself. is a eleven and a half thousand lines of code. Everything it includes, and there's lots of other random libraries. Um, we'll, we'll bloat that. Um, I'm a bit finger in the air here. I would say five days to get the DSP and five days to get the UI moved across. I think I had the DSP running after two days. It but, was really quick, yeah. But I think that there were some bugs um, or bits that I hadn't finished, but it was a couple of days. So I'm just rounding up to a week. I reckon I spent half a day um, with that wood panel for getting the logo, <laughs> the, the, trying to overlay the, uh, the new name. Yeah. Because I had to like, kind of get rid of the old thing yeah, from the bitmap. Yeah. It, okay. it took hours. Um, and then obviously, you know, where are we here? Well, we've got support for various platforms. I mean, basically all of the modern Mac and Windows machines um, run it on, a, on an iPad. We can run it on a phone. Um, run it on the web. And the plugin standards we support run, obviously, in a more extensive, I mean, the more modern versions of everything that, that went before. So with standalone, we've got clap support, and you can do a, a standalone build via clap. There's a clap wrapper. Um, the clap guys have got quite a lot of interesting support for things like VST3. Um, and then we also do a juice export, which gives us the other, like a AAX um, build. Our web audio is another exporter we support, so you can, gen you can actually generate a plugin that runs in a browser. And I think if you go to our site, you can play with this in the browser, can't you? It's on our you, demos page. Yeah, as, you can do it as an embedded um, plugin. The other thing I was going to mention, because for some reason it hasn't been mentioned very much, is um, the Waveform door, which is Jules's other company. Um, has got native C major support built into the into the door. So if I um, drag a plug in here and select uh, Pro 54, then that is the um, plugin running in the door, JIT compiled. So again, if I went and edited this, the um, move my where's my control? Dumb thing did I do? I mm. moved it. it was in here. Let's just um, mess up that um, control in the top corner. If I come back to, oh, there it is. It's in the wrong place. <laughs> so, so we're running. We're running um, a, a C major patch in a door, uh, potentially looping MIDI audio through it, and you are also able to live code it at the same time. So there's some quite sort of really sort of powerful productivity benefits from thinking in, in C major. Um, so yeah, so this is the sort of world we're now in. So, so Pro 54 is actually shipping with Waveform. Yeah, we've built basically. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's sort of bundled. Um, but also the source code for it is available on the C major website as in the examples. So it's, it's freed, it's, it's out there. You can go and download it, you can play with it. Um, so that's where we are with it. Um, so trying to come up with some conclusions here. Um, this can be done. This does work. Um, I would um, say it's fun. <laughs> and you know, moving an old project to work on new platforms is fun. <laughs> there we are. Think of that. Yeah. Um, you can do this multiple different ways. So if you just do this, the, the approach that we used here, which is just say, this is the shape of the original. I'm not going to refactor it in any way. I'm just going to bodge the code in and sort of like force it through the compiler till it works. 
um, you don't end up with any componentization. You don't end up with any sort of reusable components like, oh, there's a nice filter that I could use in another project, stuff like that. So I would suggest that if you were to do something like this, a much more sensible sort of next step is to then tease it apart a little bit and then end up with potentially some pieces of DSP and C major that you can use in other projects. We did this with... Um, free verb and the zeta reverb. So I mean, I, I think if I um, if I come in here and, and look at um, the Pro 54 running, the giveaway really is if you if you come down in here and look at the graph, um, what do we see? We get there's a load of parameters, and they go into something, one big block. <laughs> And, and then, then, the thing then comes some out. audio comes out. <laughs> so it's it's not very modular, you know. It's, it's not been it's not been teased apart. So um, that's that's um, what Rock Pro 54 looks like. Um, oh damn it! I haven't got my path set up right. Um, if I showed you Zeta Reverb, you'd see that there's uh, filters and you know, different components pulled out. And Freeverb looks the same with all passes. There's like a sensible graph of reusable components. So um, if you are going to do this. Um, go the extra mile, and then you will then end up with components that can be used in other projects. Um, That's it, really? Yeah. Um, was there anything else? I think that was our last slide. No, I think that was us. Um, but yeah, go have a go, have, have a look at it online, play around, have a hack at the code. Yeah. Or just play some nice sounds. It's fun. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for the fascinating talk. Do we have any questions? Oh, okay, not wanting to go to the pub <laughs> just yet. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question. Uh, one question that I had is, of course you can take C major, export it over to C++. So let's say that we took that Pro 54 and that we, did, we used the C++ export or the Juice export. How out of the box would that be? Um, if I come here to the um, uh, the waveform project, there's actually also in my um, build here is a VST three build of Pro 54. This is the this is the the same project exported as a Juice project. CMake build. Um, it just yeah. It, it just works. It just works. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, I mean, the, the, the performance of the JIT one, which is this built-in one, will be better, or could be better, but generally is, because it knows what the actual machine is. I mean, in the modern world of, um, you know, ARM Max, the, um, the reality is that the JIT compiler and the sort of offline compiler know what processor you're actually running on your machine. So there's not that much difference in the generated code. Whereas in um, x64 land, it's a bit different because there's 20 something years of progress. So when you're jitting for an x64 target, it makes quite different like, native compiled choices than the offline compiler that's supporting processes from 20 years ago. So, so, so you're saying too. that um, from a, from a company standpoint, it may be better to use C major as a media language that you could then export if you needed to or port to mm -hmm. other yeah. languages to C++, yeah. I mean, to JavaScript, or yeah. I mean, whatever. The reality is that if you're shipping a real product at the moment, you probably want to ship it in all those variety, baked in native varieties, but, um, but it's still quick. it should be still quick to iterate on it live and then do that. It's kind of that's the that's the the, uh, the pitch really for C What's for C does major. What does C code look like? Is it maintainable as C plus plus when you've exported it? Um, no, you wouldn't want to maintain that. Right. You would just regenerate. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you were using a JIT, and um, I just wonder when a system is under heavy load, do you encounter any moments where the JIT hits some code that isn't it's built not yet, and it? Hitches, cause it, like no, it's no, it's, you're thinking of a JIT like a JavaScript or a Java JIT. It's not, it's, it's not uh, dynamically jitting. It, it pre-jits the DSP into it, and then it's all done and ready and highly optimized, and then it just runs. So it, there's no, it's all completely real-time safe. There's no, 
it, you know, it's not it's not got s slow or fast modes, and it doesn't like you know do any dynamic jitting. So so if you if you load a patch um, in waveform, um, there is a jitting thread that will compile the code into objects like in assembler in memory, and then it steps back and says, there you go, there's there's your compiled code, and then you just run it. So it's at that point it's like loading a library or something like that. There's no there's no differences there. Yeah. So the the performance is good. Um, as Jules says, it's it's safe. There's no it doesn't ever leave the code. There's no external dependencies on that code, um, and the, there's locality for um, memory use. So all of the memory that the the the, the C major uh, code reaches is in a fixed block. It doesn't allocate, it doesn't sort of spam memory in random memory locations. So it's very cache friendly, it's very CPU friendly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a simple shape. Uh, just as well, um, you mentioned you were in NI and now you're not. What was mm -hmm. the reason for that? Um, we agreed with them to just take this out of, outside the company and um, to develop it independently. Thank you guys for the talk. Super cool stuff. Um, I have one very basic question uh, and, and then a second one. Um, for the JavaScript uh, part, the UI part, uh, how do you handle reactivity? Do you use any like framework built for that or is it like you, you provide simple hooks for It's framework agnostic. You get um, the, uh, you know, you're given a, a, a view, a web view to to, to put your JavaScripts in, you could use React. I mean, we use web components and, and vanilla JavaScript for all our stuff, because uh, I don't like all those layers. But you, you could use any framework you want. And then um, we have um, like an API. You, you're basically given um, a, an, an object that lets you talk to the processor that's running. And that object lets you do things like send it events, receive events, um, you know, ask it various things. This is a whole API, it just has a JavaScript class. So you can call that from any framework you like. So we're, we're agnostic about what the actual GUI is built with, um, but we give you the, the, the API to use. And that API talks to the processor through its own magic backend, which could be, so if you're running it as a plugin, then that JavaScript class is talking directly into the same, to the, the, the processor in the same process in, in the host. But if you're running in, say, VS Code or with our server, it could be across a web socket, it could be on a different machine. So you can actually run the, the UI on a completely different machine to the back end, and your UI code doesn't have to change at all because that um, our kind of you know we, we take care of that communication between this our API that's visible to the JavaScript end and the back end that's doing the work. I see. Yeah, so this 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 worker, which is a, basically a, a, a UI, this default function is getting called, um, which hands it a patch connection. So the, the engine calls in, instantiates it, and calls in and says, here's your patch connection, and do whatever you like from there. So at this point, we um, hook in and add listeners for various events and things like that. Um, so then we get these, these sort of um, handlers here for different things happening with the patch. So I mean, a midian is, is probably a fairly straightforward one. So um, we're listening for midian. Um, we had a listener, and the MIDI in listener says, we've received a MIDI event, it's a controller, um, and it sets the program. Basically, if, if we get a, um, if we get a, a basically a, a bank select and then a program change, it's finding out what the program is, and then it's saying to the connection, um, change the current program, basically, to the, to the new one. Um, and that's enough to trigger um, the loading of all of the parameters. Nice, thank you. And uh, to follow up to that, I had a question more like zooming out of the specific project. Um, you mentioned Rust very quickly in passing, mm -hmm. um, but it makes me curious from the vantage point of you guys as the creators of C major, where do you see Rust in the audio space? Um, a lot of people in other industries believe it to be the next thing to build real-time and low-level systems with uh, in audio. What's your, ta what's your guys' take on that? Thanks. Um, I, I mean, I, I personally think that you shouldn't be writing audio stuff in Rust. You should be writing it in C major. 
<laughs> obviously. Um, but um, I, I mean, I, I've seen things come and go in the industry, and um, if there's some compelling reasons to use Rust, then great, go for it. Um, at the end of the day, it's about making stuff that does what you want, is maintainable, performs well. Um, and, if, and if Rust is the right answer for your company or for the, you know, part of the, the industry, then that's right. But what it will then look like in 10 years' time, I don't know. Um, and are you then staring at a load of Rust going, oh, God, why do we write this in Rust? You know, it's, 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 your, it's kind of your mistake to make, if you, if you see. Or, or you can be ahead of the curve and produce a really helpful library that everyone relies on for years to come, juice. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're building something that's going to be just a, a standalone blob of code, write it in whatever makes sense. Use Rust. If you're kind of interfacing with all the existing stuff in the audio world, then most of it's going to be C++. C major, C++. And, um, I see major, hopefully, but um, but C plus so it's probably easier just to stick to that. But um, I don't know. I don't have strong feelings. They're all just native languages. They're all compiled. It's, it, I think it's only languages. only with hindsight that you feel stupid with yeah. this with this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and and you you will for reasons. And you I don't know if I could predict what they would be. I would feel less stupid. <laughs> but it's just how it is. So. Um, no, it's an interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, I'd, I'd love to add a, a Rust exporter to yeah, C major, but I'd need to have a reason to. Um, and if a re reason came along, I'd write one. Yeah, it's not catching on as quickly as it is in other parts of the but when it does, industry. But maybe it will. When it does, we'll we'll do it. Yeah. Oh, so I also say, obviously, it's an open source project. If you want to write a Rust exporter, yeah. do one, and we can include well, it. You'll have to write it in C++. But. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, that's a really good talk. Um, how long did you spend, and how did you verify that all your knobs and switches were doing exactly what they should be doing? or? Oh, was man. it just easy enough? It was like, you bing, think bing, it's okay? yeah, that'll do. Um, <laughs> so, in, in, um, if, I was, if it was just a pure C major project, we have a test framework, and you can write automated re replayable tests. So you say, load this patch, set these, so send these events at these moments in times, like play this MIDI, set this parameter like this, blah, 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 blah. So you could, in theory, write tests for the for the DSP. Um, what that would spot here would be regression. So if I changed the code and it broke it, but I can't do the equivalent for Pro 53, so I'm not really in a position to be able to produce test output from one thing and then say, verify it to the other. It would just be a pain. But we did um, go through the patches and go, oh, this one's called, Celestial. This one's called Celestial Bells. That sounds so yeah, 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 yeah. So they, yeah, I, mean, I, yeah, I went through all of that. Definitely yeah. made sure they, you know, they all They're, matched. Yeah. But, yeah. but yes, um, and then, yeah, so there's, there's the regression testing. And then obviously, at that point, you can, um, if you have tests like that um, in your CI system, you can run the same test on all of your supported platforms um, with versions, get performance numbers, blah, blah, blah. So there's quite a lot of useful things you can do there with, with, a, with a test like that. Um, but it probably wouldn't help me test that the old code did the same as the new code. Yeah, that's always, I think, a challenge when yeah. you're porting mm. from one thing to another. Every time you yeah. change, oh, I'll just rewrite this bit and make it a little bit nicer. You're like, yeah. Well, yeah. Have I that changed the behavior or have yeah. I just? I mean, the other thing, of course, that's really great about audio is no one dies. <laughs> um, so if I have got it slightly wrong, yeah, yeah, maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe but, yeah, but someone with magic ears will just hear that filter. <laughs> oh, this is not, not right. Yeah, yeah, get angry. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Drive that car too fast. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much for the talk. So a lot of the like DSP engine that is written in, in C++ actually relies on other libraries, right? And even on the C++ standard library. So do you have any way of like interfacing that engine, like a DSP engine written in C++ with C major, or you have to rewrite everything from scratch on C major? Well, we, we have our own standard library um, that does the basics, and we'll keep expanding that. Um, the, so the one, one thing that's very important here is C major is domain specific. 
only does audio. You're not going to write um, bit twiddling, you know, data handling, WAV file changing logic in C major. That's not its domain. So it's, it's the DSP. It's the real-time bit of a plugin is written in C major. So if you're sort of thinking about the libraries that you pull in, you'll be sitting there thinking, oh, MP3, how do I load that into a in memory? It's like that is never going to be in C major. That is not the point, really, of C major. Um, so that's why when we talk about there's this, there's, there's always bits around the edge and like what's the right shape for them. Um, that's an interesting, interesting discussion. But if we then go, so, so, if, so talking specifically about DSP though, um, yes, we've got a standard library of, you know, Butterworth filters and stuff. You don't want everyone to keep rewriting these things. So it isn't huge though. It's the beginning of that library. Um, and if you've got anything that you want to include, um, Hilbert's. Yeah, do we throw a Hilbert haven't, in there? Haven't, haven't, have we got it? Haven't, haven't got, got a Hilbert. Haven't got a Hilbert. Yeah, you see. I know how to do well, it now. We, of course, support, I'm fairly certain, complex filtering. I think you can put complex data types through our filters. Mm -hmm. You've got FFTs in there? Yeah. Yeah. They're um, not hugely performant, but they're not bad. But going back, just to answer the question about can you, can you interface to a C++ library. Not a library, no. You, we do have a foreign function call interface that we really don't want anyone to use. So there is a way, if, you've, if, you're, building, if you're building an app and you're embedding Ogis Engine in it and you're going to run some C major code, you can give it some hooks into your own library that the C major code can call. We don't recommend anyone does that because obviously that means that piece of C major code won't run on anything else. You can't, you know, if, if, if you've got the library in your app, then that C major code isn't going to run in the browser, it's not going to run on other platforms, it's not going to run in the normal JIT engine. So you're kind of missing the point. But if you were writing something very custom, you can do that. And we, we will use that as well in the future to make, to accelerate things. So, um, like if we get to a point where we need like some particularly optimized big matrix operations or something where, uh, where we can't do that just with C major code on its own, we'll kind of secretly hook in a, a, a kind of call out to a very optimized piece of, piece of SIMD um, for a particular platform. But that's hidden from the user and all code can take advantage of it. But you can do your own, but it, it, it is kind of, yeah, it's, it would be missing the point a bit. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. We all done with questions? Oh. oh, where's the We're pub? Out of time. Yeah, what, where's what the pub? Yeah. We're at the we pub. Are, oh God, it's nearly nine o'clock. And talk, find us. Any more questions? Come find us. Talk. Yeah, yeah, I got a. I got bad news and good news. The good news is that Jules and Ches will be at the Red Lion. <laughs> yes. uh, for the pub, for pub and drinks after, which is if you go outside of Cone Node, take a left. It'll be on your right hand side. So any other questions? Please feel free to ask Jules and Ches. They'd love to talk to you about C major. Please give it up for Jules and Chess.